Church, would you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Deuteronomy chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 23 through 29. Deuteronomy chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 23 through 29. As you're turning, where are we? We find ourselves nearing the end of the the historical prologue of Moses recounting all of their winnings and their wanderings. For 40 years they have wandered a great and terrible wilderness. They have defeated two kings and they stand at the border of promise. Can you imagine with me waiting 40 years for something? And this is finally the moment that you get to enjoy it. Moses stands on the edge of everything he's ever hoped for. He has seen flashes of God's glory. He saw the thunders at Mount Sinai. He has seen drops of God's kindness and the manna and the water from the rock. He stands at the very cusp of more. And he pours out a passionate plea, God, give me more. And do you know what he hears? No. No. Have you ever heard the word no? Those two letters form the hardest sound in the English language. No. Instead of a sermon and a sentence, let's just read the passage and understand what to do with no. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we find ourselves today on the very edge of what we can possibly understand. We find ourselves at the very border of things too great and too marvelous for me. I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart as we think of some of the griefs and sorrows we have experienced at that simple word, no. Would you remove any doubt, any grief, any hardship, the iniquity that would prevent us from hearing your word, that we may hear it and see the great God behind it. Help us to understand who you are through the reading and preaching of your word and strengthen our faith accordingly. Father, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Church, let's pick up in verse 23. Hear the word of the Lord. And I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me because of you, and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, Enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift up your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward, and look at it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan. But charge Joshua and encourage him, And strengthen him, for he shall go over at the head of this people, and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. So we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word this morning. Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird gave me some great advice. Never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. 
I know just about everybody in this room fairly well. So I'm asking a question I already know the answer to. Have you ever prayed and prayed and prayed and lost sleep playing? Wet your, tear, your pillow with tears praying and only to hear the word no. 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 I think of David. The sin with Bathsheba, she gets pregnant. God says the child will die and David for days weeps and fasts he clothes himself with sackcloth. He puts ashes upon his head. He prays and he prays and he prays. And David heard. In the silence of that passing child, David heard very loudly, No. Really, Lord? How many of us parents have prayed for our children? Day in and day out, and every time we hear a word of bad news, what we hear is no. Our young people go to bed. They lie in beds filled with insecurity, praying to God for wisdom about the future. And in the morning, insecurity whispers in their ears no. Be it the recovery of our health, the health of our relationships, and every hiccup, and every obstacle, and every road bump, we hear the word no. No word in the English language has caused more heartache than no. George Herbert captured it well. He writes, When my devotion could not pierce, thy silent ears. Then was my heart broken, as was my verse. My breast was full of tears and disorder. My bent thoughts, like a brittle bow, did fly asunder. Each took his own way. Some would to pleasures go, some to wars and thunders of alarm. But it's good to go anywhere, they say, than to be numb both knees and heart and crying night and day, come, come, my God, oh, come, but no hearing. Oh, that you should give dust a tongue to cry to thee and then not hear it crying. All day long my heart was in my knees, but no hearing. Therefore my soul lay out of sight, untuned and unstrung, my feeble spirit, unable to look right, like a nipped blossom, hung, discontented. O oh, cheer and tune my heartless breast, defer no time, so that thy favors granting my request, they and my mind may chime and mend my rhyme. Do you understand what George Herbert is saying? Nights he spent on his knees, chest to his knees, weeping and crying. And all George Herbert heard was, no. Moses is hunched over in the same way. Many of us have been in that same situation and we ask God, does our devotion not pierce your silent ears? Why? That is our question today. Why shouldn't God answer my prayer? Have I served him for nothing? Have you felt this way? Look at Moses in Hebrews chapter 3. Paul praises Moses as faithful in all God's house. Not some of his house, not most of his house, but in all of his house. That's a high praise. Moses faithfully served the Lord. 
Moses had a stuttering problem and yet defied the world's most powerful man. Moses led 600,000 men plus women and children for 40 years in a great and terrible wilderness. Many of us recount Exodus 16, 18. Moses' father-in-law Jethro comes to town and he finds Moses as a single man hearing all the qualms and complaints of 600,000 plus people. When did that man get any sleep? He was faithful. He delivered the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai for crying out loud. And he punished every transgression against it. Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Does not all that faithfulness deserve a yes? In my favorite series of books by Marilyn Robinson called Gilead, there was a Presbyterian minister named Robert Bowton, faithful man, godly man, but he had one son named Jack who was not. Jack would escape from family activities, he would skip church, he would blow up mailboxes, he would spend all of his night in a bar, and finally his father's forgiveness was tested when he got a young girl pregnant and skipped town for St. Louis. Robert Bowton is said to have come to the last inch of his power to forgive. And there was Jack, still far beyond his reach. 21 years later, Jack comes home, but he's never quite home. Jack seems to be so close Forgiveness seems to be just an inch away, but all his father hears is no. Doesn't he deserve better? He's Presbyterian. He's been serving God faithfully his whole life. Doesn't God owe him one? Do you hear in that the sense of entitlement? As if God was our debtor? as if we scratched his infinite back and now he must scratch ours. What's been, what is lacking from this equation is sin. Moses sinned. We remember in the book of Numbers, the people were complaining. They were thirsty. Moses gets angry and God says, look, don't strike the rock, speak to it. And before all the people, Moses dishonored the name of the Lord. Jesus says the same of us in the book of Luke. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, you say, we are but unworthy servants, for we have only done what is our duty. We have done nothing to place God under an obligation are to merit an IOU, we are not entitled to a yes, and God is not obligated to give it. But shouldn't God answer our prayers? I mean, look at Moses. He just wants to see God's glory. Isn't that a good thing? We see in verse 24, O oh Lord God, you've only begun to show your servant. You hear that humility? your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours. Moses isn't asking for much. He's not asking for a house on Mallard Lake and an RV. He's asking to be a bump on the log. He just wants to see more. And we've heard this before. Jesus says in Matthew 14, speaking to his disciples, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they did not see it. And to hear what you hear, and they did not hear it. They begged to see God's glory. 
Peter says they searched diligently to see God's glory in Christ, but they did not see it. We too long to see God's glory, don't we? Come to our Wednesday nights, and what do I hear often? Lord, heal so-and-so, that the world may know you're a healer, and you may receive the glory. Lord, help my kid do well in school, that you may receive the glory. Lord, help my marriage. Help my aging parents. Help me, that you may receive the glory. We can multiply that list by a million, couldn't we? Aren't those good things? Aren't they? Why would God say no? And yet what do we read from the psalmist? Our God is in the heavens. And he does whatsoever he pleases. He is in the heavens. He has a clear view of what is best. Nothing pleases God more than his glory. Why did God create the heavens and the earth? For his glory. Why did God save a single sinner? For the praise of the glory of his grace. We read the Ten Commandments and the very first commandment enshrines God's glory as the chief operating principle of this world. God is concerned with his glory and he does not need our suggestions on how to make it known. He does not need to dance to the beat of our own drum in his free and infinite wisdom. God displays his glory on his terms, not ours. Benjamin Morgan Palmer, famous Southern Presbyterian, buries a young little boy. Can you imagine? I look at all the mothers here holding their little babies. Can you imagine how much that mother prayed for that child? And you know what she heard? No. She was a godly woman. The husband was not. And to put the matter as plainly as possible, Palmer asked the woman, what if God should, through your loss, win your husband to himself? And with her eyes sparkling in the dew of her own tears, she said, oh, if it could only be so. Little did she know, three days later, in the cover of darkness, her husband walks into the pastor's study. And with a smile on his face, he said, I've come to tell you I have found Jesus, and I've given him my heart. His wife did not know. The next day, the pastor went to the women's circle, and the woman walked in with a dark shadow of grief covering her face, she did not know. So he asked her, have you talked to your husband? All she could say was, is there a new sorrow for me to bear? Palmer describes her as a trembling dove in the hand of her God, unknown to her that that God was her father. As the pastor told her the news, a ray of joy pierced her grief, and she said, Has God really given me my husband? Palmer's story illustrates a very real point that behind every dark cloud of providence lies God's smiling face, that our God has a plan for manifesting his own glory. We have to wait and see. This asks a serious question, and it requires a serious answer. Why pray? Does he answer? Does God have the silent ear of which George Herbert accused him? We find the answer does not come from our worth nor our wisdom. The answer comes from God's mercy. Our wisdom and our worth do not unlock 
the heart of God, only his mercy can turn the key. We see mercy in verse 27. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift up your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes. Mercy. A 120-year-old man climbed to the top of a mountain with the eyesight to see. Mercy. God sustained the health of Moses that he could train Joshua and prepare the people to enter the land. Mercy. He strengthened the faith of, no of Moses to see far beyond where his eyes could carry him. Mercy. God answered in his own way. But the mercy continues, doesn't it? We have read Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus ascends the Mount with Peter, James, and John, and he is transfigured before them, and the great cloud comes down, and the Father speaks, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Tell me, who else was on that mountain? It was Moses. It was Moses. He wanted to see God's glory. And God let him see it in the face of Jesus Christ. His prayer was answered in a way he could not even imagine. And what of Jesus? Who can forget the night in the garden? With his heart in his knees, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. He prayed until blood soaked the ground beneath him. Let this cup pass from me. Now we know the father's ear is never silent to his son. Jesus says in John 11, I thank you, Father, that you have heard me. I know you always hear me. We look at Hebrews chapter 5 and it speaks to this moment. It says, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard. Was he? Was he saved from death? Not by being spared from death, but by conquering death. Far beyond what we can ask or think, Jesus' prayer was answered. Jesus and Moses both heard no. Not this way. Church, this same Jesus can save to the uttermost, for he ever lives to make intercession for us. As the spear pierced the side of Christ and split it open, so we can be assured that the ear of Jesus Christ is always open for us. There is no silent ear in heaven. So when we pray, and we pray, and we hear no, what should we do? When our Father and our Savior answer in the negative, what did Jesus do? What did Moses do? They continued to be obedient. To borrow a line from Elizabeth Elliot, they did the next thing. Though the answer to prayer was no, God's will was a yes. What was most important for them was not what they asked for, but him of whom they asked it. What did Moses do when he heard no? Did he pout? Did he sin? Did he undermine Joshua's leadership? Did he stick it to him? No. Moses continued to train Joshua, the one who would hear yes. 
he continued to prepare the people who would enjoy a land that he himself would not enjoy. Even though the reason for no was unclear, God's commands were crystal clear. Moses responded to a no with a yes, because God meant more to him than the gift. What of Jesus? He did not get out of Dodge. He did not call a legion of angels, but he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Nothing but dark clouds lay before him, but he continued to be obedient to the crystal clear commandment of his father. Now what of us? God told you no over and over and over. We see Jesus Christ more clearly than Moses did. We see Christ crucified, buried, raised to the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. We stand upon the border of promise with even more clear eyesight than Moses had with a clear vision of his grace and his glory. When God says no, are we to pout? Are we to doubt? Or are we to continue in obedience? When God tells us no, we respond with a yes. Can I pray? Heavenly Father, you have brought before us this morning many challenging things. Some of us have prayed for days and weeks and months and years and decades. And we hear no. And we lay in our bed at night and we ask ourselves, why, oh God, why? Why do you not hear? I pray that you would impress upon all of our hearts the reality that you do hear. For you have given us more than an ear, you have given us your son. Help us to see in Jesus Christ your wisdom, your power, and your goodness. Help us to be obedient to the calling of which we have been called, regardless of how we feel. Help us to be obedient to what has been clearly revealed until your answer comes from on high. Help us to trust you, even when we do not hear what we want. That can only be a work of your spirit. So, Lord, pour it out upon us in greater measure today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Church, would you stand with me?